Amen. So, 2 Samuel chapter 1, uh, getting into the new book, of course, we uh, went through Philippians, and then prior to that, we were in 1 Samuel, and we're picking it up, kind of, the story picks up basically right at the, uh, you know, where we left off in 1 Samuel, and um, one of the things I want to point out before we kind of get into the, you know, I'm not, I can't focus on everything that's in this chapter, uh, there's a lot of stuff there, I kind of want to make sure we're, we're moving along through the book, but... Um, in 2 Samuel, one thing you see about David that's worth pointing out, at least briefly, is the fact that, you know, David is not somebody who was a, uh, you know, a poor winner. You know, you've always heard about being a sore loser, you know, when you, when you lose fairly, you know, you, sh you should be gracious and things like that. And, but, you know, on the other hand, sometimes people can be a poor winner. You know, sometimes people win and they really rub it in your nose and they're, you know, they, they, they jump out of their seat and they're, they're running around the table and like flipping the Monopoly board over or whatever else, you know, and they really let you have it because sometimes it just really feels good to do that, right? And we understand that. But, uh, you know, and there's, of course, it's there's always that feeling, but we always teach people, we teach our kids, at least we should be, to try to, you know, be respectful, be kind, you know, to, you know, to, to, to not rub it in people's faces. And that's what David, you know, he really displays that here where he kind of goes through this lament, right? And he talks about, uh, you know, how David, how, how they were mighty in their, in, their, in their life, they were beautiful in their time and so on and so forth. I really don't want to get into all that, you know, but it is worth pointing out that, you know, David did feel that way. And I don't, I don't think Dave was just, you know, doing that for show, just saying like, well, I got to make sure I'm gracious here in my victory. I, he really felt these things about Saul. He really felt these things about Jonathan, his son. He was really heartbroken over what happened. And you see that through the kind of the story that takes place here in chapter one, how he handles this Amalekite that comes to him and talks about and tells him that he's the one that killed Saul. And that's really who I want to focus on tonight is this Amalekite. And I've titled this sermon, uh, you know, Three Strikes for the Amalekite. Three Strikes for the Amalekite. You know, he had, he had a couple, he had three things that he does here that are bad, where he kind of fouls, right? Where he makes these mistakes and he gets, you know, you know, it's not just an ejection from the game, like he loses his, his life, right? And, you know, the purpose really that I want to kind of focus on him, the reason I, why I want to focus on him is is so that we can be forewarned of the unforeseen consequences of sin. You know, we always think sometimes that, you know, we're going to get into some sin, but it's not going to be that bad. We know there's going to be some repercussions or whatever. But here's the thing about sin is that you don't know how far it's going to take you. You know, you don't know what the consequences are going to be. You can expect certain consequences, but we can't always see the unfor... You know, we can't always see everything that's going to be result because of our sin. And really, I think the sin here that the Amalekite is particularly uh, guilty of is that of covetousness. He's a covetous person. And that was kind of their, you know, their culture or whatever. If you recall, in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, the Amalekites, you know, they came and they raided Ziklag when David, when it was defenseless and David was gone and they took all the spoil and David had to go back and get it. So, uh, you know, real quick though, 2 Samuel, we're getting into the book. What's it about? It's basically just chronicling the life of David you know, after he becomes king, you know, he takes over as king in Judah and eventually Israel. And it's, it's basically that. And we'll get into all the, <laughs> the nitty gritty as we go along. But, um, you know, first Samuel, he's fleeing, right? He's been fleeing from Saul. Now he's taking over. And it begins the book here with this tale of caution that, you know, in the Malachite being the example of that story. So the, street, the three strikes for the Malachite, what was strike one? Well, strike one was that he was an Amalekite. You know, that right there was something he had working against him. And I'll, you know, clarify what I mean by that. But if you look at verse five, it says, And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when they looked upon, when they looked, when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, here am I. And he said to me, who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. So he's identifying himself in the, in the retelling of the story that actually didn't take place. We'll get into that too. But you say, well, why is that a strike to be an Amalekite? Well, remember David, you know, what, I can imagine David's reaction. He's kind of listening. And then he says, well, I'm an Amalekite. Kind of went, you know, he kind of like perks up a little bit. Like, say what? You know, come again? Because if you remember, David has already had some, I mean, just within the last three days, has had some really hard dealings with these Amalekites, right? He's already been harmed by them and has already had to go fight them. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 30, when David and his men, they came to Ziklag, it's been burned with fire. They've taken all the, the wives and children captive. They spoiled everything. David has to go pursue them. 
you know, the, his men get so distraught that they're, they're talking about stoning him, and, he, and, you know, and it says he encouraged himself in the Lord, right? And, of course, we know how that story went, is that eventually he recovers all. He gets everything back. He doesn't lose, and nobody gets harmed. No one dies, and, if, and he covers everything, and then he spoils the Amalekites. Point being is that when this guy comes up and says and identifies himself as an Amalekite, you know, he must not have heard what was going on recently. He must not have known what had just taken place with David. Maybe, you know, you wonder, where was this guy? Was, you know, what was he doing? How did he not know that David had just, you know, wiped out a, a vast, you know, just a huge number of these Amalekites? I mean, David, as it says there in verse 1, right, now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from what? The slaughter of the Amalekites. He just gets done slaughtering them all, and this guy just comes along. You know, and we'll get into it here. I don't think he, you know, part of me thinks this guy didn't intentionally do that because he kind of lets it slip. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but he, he lets it out that he's an Amalekite. And David just got done slaughtering them. And, you know, we could go to that story. won't take the time to do it, but he talks about how David smote them from twilight even on the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. So the only guys that got out of there were the ones that had, you know, the four-wheel drive or the, or the four-foot drive, right, to get out of there on the camels because everybody else got wiped out. You know, and uh, here's the thing about that is, you know, that's, that, that should be a message to God's enemies, you know, the people that oppose the people of God, is that, you know, when you, when you lose, don't come around again. <laughs> don't come around and say, oh, I'm one of them. Oh, yeah, I, I was one of those people that you just slaughtered. You know, because we see how it kind of goes here, Right. You know, when God's people are victorious, when, you know, when the enemies of God have been defeated, the best thing for them is just to slink off. The best thing for them is just to fade into the sunset, to go away. Don't come back around, unless you're some kind of a glutton for punishment. You know, and that's what a lot of these, these, these people, you know, on the internet are like. These people that get thrown out of churches, and then they, you know, they, they, they're outed as heretics or perverts or whatever it is. They're just disgruntled, and they get bitter. And then they go start some YouTube channel, and then they're just trolling all the channels. You know, they're coming around. It's like, are you thirsty for more? Did you want to come back and, and get beat up some more? Like, what are you doing? You're like this Amalekite who doesn't realize there was, you just got slaughtered. Your people just got wiped out, and now you're coming back thinking that you're going to be some big shot, and then you get some more. You know, and then he, and then he loses his life over it. But, you know, the thing is about, you know, and I'm kind of going off a little bit, I admit. But it's that sometimes I just got to, all right? These, these, these people that come around and leave the comments and, and they can't get over the fact that they've been defeated, you know, that they're, they've been, they've been uh, beaten by God's people, you know, what, they, what just goes to show you that they are, a lot of times, they are reprobates. You know, because reprobate, as it says in Jude, they just can't help but, what, foam out their own shame. You know, they just can't help but manifest what they are to other people. So I don't want to go on and on about that, but I just thought that was kind of an interest, interesting parallel, is that you have this guy whose people have been just slaughtered by God's people, by God's man, but he still wants to come back around and say, well, I'm an Amalekite too, you know, and, and try to, you know, lie basically to the man of God. But that was strike one for the Amalekite, just, the, just by fact that he is an Amalekite, right? And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, don't forget that David, you know, when he went and slaughtered the Amalekites, He's actually fulfilling the curse of God that, that upon the Amalekites. As you remember, and go to Luke chapter 12. I'm going to have you go there eventually. But if you were to go to Deuteronomy 25, Exodus 17, you would read about the fact that God wanted the Amalekites killed. He said in Deuteronomy 25, Remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, when you were come forth out of Egypt. Talking about when they were coming out of Egypt, how and the Amalekites attacked the hindermost of the people, the weak, those that were lagging behind. They were fighting like cowards. That's what they do, God's enemies. He said, but remember what they did when you came forth for Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. <clears throat> Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God shall hath given thee Rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You say, what do you mean? He's, you know, one of the things he's got going against him is just the fact that he's a Malachite. Well, you know, there's some people that God just says, you know what? They're going to be blotted out from under heaven. They're just going to be wiped out. When they become God's enemies, when they become the enemies of God's people, when they attack, when they do harm to God's people, God says, well, you know what? Maybe I'll just have you blotted out. Maybe I'll have you just taken out. And that kind of thing happens. 
You know, we've seen that kind of thing happen. People who want to attack, you know, uh, uh, man, the, the men of God that we know, attack church members and things like that, who I, I believe God just took them right out, like literally killed them. That kind of thing happens. You say, would God do that? I mean, he's talking about an entire nation of people. Kill the Amalekites. G you know, generations later, God still remembers it. I mean, what was Saul's big sin? The fact that he didn't go and kill the Amalekites. That would kick the whole thing off, right? Remember that? He was supposed to go kill the Amalekites, and you know, Samuel had to come along and say, what it mean at the bleeding of the, of, the, of the sheep in my ears? And he's the one that had to grab Ke King Agag and hack him up in little pieces. But God wanted the Amalekites wiped out. So that's one thing this guy has working against him, just the fact that he is an Amalekite. And you can see that in Exodus 17 as well. Now, the application is this, is that no matter how good life is for the heathen, it never ends well. You know, let that be a lesson to anybody who looks at the unsaved, who looks at the world that says, oh, I wish I could be more like them. You know, I wish I could just get out from my parents' house, just get out from under their rules, and just go run wild like all my friends, and just go do this and go do that. You know, let, let it be a lesson to you. They might be having fun, but it never ends well. The way of the transgressor is hard, the Bible says. You know, it's a foolish thing to envy the wicked, the Bible says. <clears throat> and the Amalekites, you know, they, they had things, things were going well for them, weren't they? They were like, hey, you know, we're, we're still here in the land. The Canaanites have been wiped out all these years later. We're still here. You know, I don't, they weren't, of course, of the Canaanite nations. We know that, but they were real close to Canaan. And, you know, they're, and, and 1 Samuel chapter 30, you know, they're like, hey, no one's here in Ziklag. They just wipe everything out. And it says when David found them, if you remember the story, when he had brought him down, the Egyptian, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing. I mean, they're at the club, right? <laughs> they're, they're having a good time. They're having a party. They're eating, they're drinking, and they're dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And then you know what happened? Then they just got wiped out. And it never ends well for the heathen, for the unsaved. And they might look like they're having a good time now, but you know, when they're you know, when the when the lights are turned off, when they're by themselves, and the guilt and the shame and everything else that comes along with living a sinful life catches up to them, it's no fun at all. And it's a foolish thing to to uh, you know envy them. And even if they lived their whole life, you know, just partying it up, living, never suffered any consequences, they're still gonna end up in hell. They're still gonna end up in hell. You think they're going to say, we get in hell and say, well, I'm glad I got to live it up on earth and, you know, rejected Christ and everything else. No, they're going to wish they had, you know, they had gotten saved and lived for God and, and were in heaven. Of course. They're gonna, you know, how long in hell is it going to take for them to come to that realization? About a second? <clears throat> Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 16. Great example of this. It says in verse 16 of Luke chapter 12, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He's saying, oh, life's just going so good. I've got so much stuff. I've got so much money. I've got so much fruits. Everything's just, you know, everything's bringing forth plentifully. Everything's going good. And he thought to himself, uh, you know, and, and he said, verse 18, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, Take thine ease, eat and drink and be merry. Now, is that not what the world wants to do? Just take their ease and eat and drink and be merry. That's all the world wants to do. They want to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, right? That's what they're all about. And we might look at that, people might look at that and be tempted to think, oh, I want that too. You know, and of course, God does, you know, fill our hearts, you know, with gladness and food. God, you know, says that it is good for us to, you know, enjoy the fruits of our labors and, and, and enjoy life. You know, we're not, up, I'm not up here preaching you have to live, you know, go home and put, you know, some kind of a hair shirt on. You know, or you, you never heard when the monks that wear these hair shirts, they got the shirts and they have like a, an itchy hair on the inside of the shirt, you know, and, and live this weird, austere life. I'm not saying that. Like, of course, there's things that we're going to enjoy in this life. But for the world, this is what their life is all about. And this guy's got more than he needs and he's not thinking, well, who can I help out with my excess? I have more than heart could wish. I could have more than I need here. My barns are full. You know, maybe there's somebody else in need. No, what's he think? Oh, I'm going to pull down more and just store it more for myself. And that sounds like, that, that sounds like the dream, doesn't that? Sounds good on the surface, but what does verse 20 say? But God said unto him, thou fool. God calls this guy a fool. 
This night shall thy soul be required of thee. You know, the Amalekites back in 1 Samuel 30, they thought, they thought hey, everything's going great. But the, what they didn't realize is that their soul was going to be required of them that very day. Then who shall all those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Go to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. You know, another example we could turn to is, you know, Lazarus and the beggar, right? Lazarus was, you know, the rich man. And when he died, he went to hell. And Lazarus, who the dogs licked his sores every day, and he tried to just get a, get a few crumbs from the rich man's table. You know, Lazarus, Excuse me, I got it backwards. Lazarus was uh, the one that was resurrected. The rich man, he went to hell. And he lifted up his eyes in hell being in torments and thought, well, I'm glad I lifted it up up there. I'm glad I lifted it up up there. You know, everything went really well. No, he was in torments, and he wanted to be where uh, Lazarus was. It's a foolish thing to envy the wicked, to look at the Amalekites of this world and think, I want to be like that. No matter how good it looks, no matter how uh, life, how it might even be for them, it's not going to end well for the heathen. Look at Psalm 73. This is a great psalm on this subject. Verse 1, truly God is good to Israel. You know, God is good to Israel. God is good to his people. God is always good to his people. Even if we might not have all the things that the world has, we still have God, and God is good to his people. That's what the Bible says. Even to such are as of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. What's going on? What's the matter here? Why is this guy saying, my feet are almost gone? My steps said, well, I was stumbling. You know, yeah, God is good, but I was really struggling. Well, what was his struggle? Verse 3, for I was what? Envious at the foolish. He was envious at the foolish. And who is the fool? The one who says, well, I'm just going to lay up more treasures and more stores, and I'm not going to be rich toward God. I was envy at everything they had. I was envy at the foolish when was he envious? When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. When he saw how well off they were. How they had everything. Verse 4, For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride cometh, compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. You know, the heathen out there, they have a lot, don't they? They have all the money, they have all the wealth, they have all the things, they have more than heart could wish. There's a lot of wicked people with a lot of excess, isn't there? And they have more than heart could wish. But look at verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. Look, the ungodly are going to prosper in the world. <clears throat> they increase in riches. And then you can kind of see the plight that he's going through. Verse 13, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. In innocency. You know, we could feel that way sometimes if we're not careful. They could say, what's the point of living the Christian life? Why should I, you know, clean my heart? Why should I keep a pure heart? Why should I wash my hands in innocency? Why should I, you know, not get my hands dirty, you know, living it up and, and living a sinful life? You know, I'm looking at the wicked and everything seems to be going. They're prospering in the world. He says in verse 14, for all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Now, verse 17 is where, where he clears everything up, right? Because he this is his plight. This is his, his vexation. You know, he's saying, what's the point of all? The wicked are prospering. I'm being chastened every morning. You know, he, he's vexed. But verse 17, he gets everything cleared up. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. He said, you know, then I went to church. I started reading my Bible. I started to see how things really were, and then I understood, ah, you know, they might be living it up now, but you know what? The end is going to be death. You know, it's not going to end well for the heathen. That's what he understood. When did he understand that? When he got right with God. <clears throat> so, you know, the pleasures of sin is the only thing that the heathen has to enjoy in this world. You know why they have so much of that? Why they have so much excess and more than heart could wish? Because that's all they have to enjoy in this world. They don't have the joy, they don't have the peace, they don't have the long-suffering, the faith, the meekness, you know, the goodness, the temperance, and so on and so forth. They don't have all the fruits of the Spirit. They don't have any of these things. They don't have the joy. All they have is the pleasures of sin, and that's why it's, they can never get enough. The riches and the cares of this world are all they're concerned with, right? And that's strike two. 
for the Amalekite. He was covetous. You know, strike one was the fact that he was an Amalekite. He was already under the curse of God. You know, the unsaved, no matter how good it goes for them in this life, they're still under the curse of God. And they're going to pay for their sins in hell. How good is that? You know, it's not worth it. <clears throat> and strike two is the fact that he was covetous. You know, if, that's, if all I have to look forward to in this world is the riches and the cares of this life, I'm going to be a covetous person because I'm just going to want more and more of what I can only get in this life. He was covetous. Look at 2 Samuel. Go over to chapter 4. Chapter 4 of 2 Samuel. David, you know, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but he, he recounts the story of, of, of 2 Samuel chapter 1. It says in verse 10, when one told me, referring back to the one he's referring to, is the Amalekite. When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took, uh, took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. See, why is this Amalekite, you know, taking the chance of walking up to David, who just got done slaughtering the Amalekites and kind of outing himself? Why is he doing this? Because he wanted to have a reward for his tidings, because he was covetous because he's a heathen, because the only thing he has to look forward to in this world are the goods and the cares and the riches and the pleasures and the sins of this life. He's covetous. You know, and he learned it from, I mean, that just seems to be what the Amalekites are about. I mean, they're spoiling Ziklag. He's looking for a reward. They just want the goods of this world. That's all they have to look forward to. He wanted to do what? He wanted to earn that easy buck, right? Well, there's a, here's an easy buck. Isn't that what the world's all about today? Go over to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. I mean, all these stupid YouTube ads. You need to get a passive income. Man, I'm making, I'm making $20,000 a month doing nothing. You know, what he's really doing is selling you a bill of goods. He probably is making $20,000 a month off of suckers like us who click the button. Well, how do you make $20,000 a month? Well, first you get on YouTube and you tell people how you can tell them uh, that they can make all this money and then you get them to pay you. Right? I'm selling stuff on Amazon. I don't even touch it. You know, I'm making all this money. Look, it, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. You know, the, and, and it's, these get rich quick schemes have always been around. And that's what this guy, you know, that's what covetous people do. They just want to make as much money as quick as they can, as easily as they can, even if it means doing something dishonest, you know, stealing, cheating, lying, robbing, killing you know, mugging, whatever, even if it comes to violence. I mean, that's what the Amalekites are all about, right? I mean, they're burning Ziklag, they're taking all the goods, they're taking all the people and going and having a party because they're covetous people. But the Bible says that wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Look, there's nothing wrong with increasing if you do it the right way. You know, if you're working hard and you're developing your skills, and you're ethical, and you have good business practices, and, you're, and you flourish, and you take off, I mean, that's the blessing of God. It's not that God just wants to keep us, you know, you know penniless and just, you know, poor for the rest of our life. It's just that if we're going to be wealthy in this world, if we're going to succeed, we have to do it the right way. You can't be like an Amalekite who's just covetous. Proverbs 23, look at verse 4. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? Now, that's important to pay attention to the wording here. He says, wilt thou set thy, thine eyes upon that which is not? Right? You got a guy who wants to labor to be rich. Right? See, sometimes we as Christians, we just look at anybody that has any kind of wealth and just say, well, they must be wicked people. That's not, that's not true. There are a lot of people who, who worked hard, you know, God blessed and became very wealthy. That's out there, right? Now, obviously, there's a lot of wealthy people who did it through wicked means. But the problem with this guy in Proverbs 23, the warning is, is to labor not to be rich. Don't make your life all about making money. That's what the Amalekites are like. That's covetousness. You know, that's going to lead to other sins. Don't labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Well, that's what the world tells me to do is just make as much money as I can. Gather as many toys as I can. You know, you know what? Cease from your own wisdom. Cease from the wisdom of this world. Don't labor to be rich. Be rich toward God. And he'll bless you. And he says there, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? You're looking at something that is, is not. It hasn't manifested. It's just something we want. It's something it is not, but we've set our eyes upon it, and now we want it, 
and we don't have it, what is that? It's covetousness. You know, when we start to think about, well, you know, like I'm, you know, it, it could happen to every one of us, including this guy. I was just out front talking about how nice that Toyota was that we rented and how I came back and thought, you know, I could use a nice new minivan. This one's getting kind of old. You know, I got to fix this window. You never know when it gets up to those higher miles when something's going to go wrong. You know, I, I probably, my wife, she deserves the latest and the greatest and the best. So, you know, that brand new 2021 toy. And then it's like, no, wait a minute. Do you really need that? Or is that just you setting your eyes upon that, which is not desiring something that you don't really need. You just kind of want it. Now, if you get those type of things, you can afford those things and work hard. Great. Go for it. Enjoy them. Right. But we shouldn't go around just living our life, laboring to be rich, just setting our eyes and everything we don't have and just desiring to have it. Go to first Timothy. Well, I'll just read you first from first Timothy. You already know it. Jesus said in Luke 12, take heed and beware of covetousness. Beware of covetousness. And people, they stay covetous because they don't get the next half of this verse where he says, for a life's man consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. You know, all the things that you have, that's not who you are. We're not all the things that we have. That, does not, that should not be what defines us. A man's life consisteth not in the things that which he possesseth. Is that what makes up life for us? Just things, just stuff? I mean, it's nice to have nice things. It's nice to be able to get things that we want and things that are useful, and I get that. But that should not be what our life is all about, just getting things, setting our eyes on that which is not. That's why I said in 1 Timothy to, you know, to, to warn them that will be rich, right? Them that will be rich. Not those that are rich, those that will be rich because the love of money is the root of all evil. So strike two against the Amalekite was the fact that he was a covetous person. He came from a very covetous culture from what it looks like. You know, and, that, and, and this is something that needs to be preached because that's the culture we're living in. We're surrounded by Amalekites today. We should call it Amalekah. <laughs> that's the name of our country. Memorial Day is coming, right? Amalika, just full of covetous people today who just are always about setting their eyes upon things which are not desiring to have more than they need, more than they can even get, just always chasing the next thing, always trying to increase their wealth, making their life about the things which they possess. And here's the thing that you say, well, why? Why should I take heed about that? Why should I take heed about covetousness? Because a covetous life is only going to lead to an unsatisfied life. I mean, do you think, I mean, that's what covetous is. It's always desiring what you don't have again and again. There's people who live their whole life. They get one thing, and then they just want the next thing. You ever notice that? You get, some, you get the latest and greatest phone, right? You get the shiniest new device, and then a week later, it's just like, it's no different than my old phone. It does the exact same thing the other one did. You know, it's like, but at the time, and then it's like, well, now I got to get the next latest and greatest. I mean, there's another one coming out this fall. What's it going to be? Now, let me go check all the, the, gadget, the, the tech channels on YouTube and see what it's going to be like. And, you know, and, and, and there's always another phone coming out. There's always a new pickup. There's always a new car. There's always some next thing that someone will gladly sell you. And we'll just keep chasing that and chasing that and chasing that. And you know what you'll end up being? Unsatisfied in life. Because a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's not what your life should be about. It should be about being rich toward God. And not only that, if you become a covetous person, not only will you remain unsatisfied, it will cause you to commit other sins. You'll get into other sins just to get whatever it is that you want in order to satisfy covetousness, right? That's strike three on the Amalekite. He was a liar. What was, what was motivating him, right? We saw it in 2 second, second Samuel chapter 4 that he wanted to get a reward for his tidings. I'm going to go to David and tell him I killed Saul. I know they're enemies. And then, I mean, I'm going to, whether or not he actually had that crown and bracelet, I don't know. I don't think he did. I think he probably had a phony or something. And he goes up and he's, you know, like, hey, here's the proof. I killed him. And he's lying. You know, we know that. And it, why is he lying, though? Because he's covetous, because he just wants that reward. If you are going to be like this Amalekite, you know, you're going to do other sins. Maybe it's not lying. Maybe it's some other worse thing. But this guy, the strike three on him is the fact that he's a liar. Look at uh, where we are, First, Second Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. It says, and David said unto the young man that told him, how knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? 
So he's kind of like, ah, you know, see, David's a smart guy. He doesn't just believe everything he hears, right? He wants to, you know, get to the bottom of it. And the young man told him and said, as I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, Saul leaned upon a spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me, and I answered, here am I. And he said unto me, who art thou? And I answered and said, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me. For anguish is come upon me, and my life is yet, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. So he's always trying to, he's already kind of, kind of given an excuse to, like, he was, he was going to die anyway. Which is true. If you go back and read the story, he was, he was, he, he was a wounded sore of the archers, right? And he asked, and the truth is, is that he asked his armor bearer to kill him. And then he wouldn't do it, and he fell upon his own sword, right? He committed suicide. So there is a grain of truth there, you know, it's like, ah, oh, but he was going to die anyway, you know, so it's okay that I kill him. You know, it's a, it, was a, it was a mercy killing. I'm a good guy. You know, I did a nice thing for Saul at the end of his life, you know. Can I get a little, uh, you know, can I get some shekels from him? He wants to get something. So I stood upon him, I slew him, and I took the crown upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and I have brought them hither unto my Lord. So now he's kind of buttering David up a little bit, calling him Lord. This guy's lying, okay? And this is a really important principle about Bible study, and I'm going to say it every chance I get until I'm blue in the face, because this would clear up a lot of confusion for people. Sometimes people come to the questions, and it's just like, they're like, well, the Bible says, and it's like, yeah, but that's just the Bible recording what somebody did or said. It doesn't mean it's a commandment from God. There's the statement of the narrator, and then there's the story that is told, right? You know, does the Bible record people lying? Yes, it does. Does it record Satan's lies? Yeah. Does it make them true? So the narrator, he tells us exactly what happens, right? In verse 1 Samuel 31, if you want to go back just one page or whatever, it's verse 4. Then Saul said unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. So he knew he was going to die. He'd been hit by an arrow, right? And he was, he was dying slowly. And he didn't want the Philistines to come upon him while he was yet alive and then, you know, torture him or whatever. But his armor bearer would not. For he was sore afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell upon it. It wasn't because he was running with scissors. It means that he took it and he leaned, he fell upon it. So they thrust himself through. He committed suicide. <clears throat> so this guy's lying. We know that because we're looking at the narrator. This does not line up with what this Malachite is telling David. Okay, so there's a good principle there. But notice how this guy lies. I kind of want to look at this a little bit. He veils his true intent behind a show of humility and respect. So his true intent is to get the reward from David, right? But he goes about this lie with, by, you know, people don't just come out, you know, and, and, and be real. When people are lying, they're trying to deceive you, right? That's what lying is. It's deception. So you got you to kind of look out for the warning signs, okay? And here we see this guy, he has this, you know, this vain show of humility, and he has this, 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 this vain respect for for King David, who just got killing, he got done slaughtering the Malachites. Now he's going to call him Lord, right? But this is what covetousness does people, right? It, it, it warps their thinking. It causes them to be deceptive. It gets them in other sins like lying. It says in verse 2, okay, it came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp, this is the Amalekite, from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. You know, it's an interesting story. The Bible doesn't really tell us exactly how this is playing out. But this guy is coming out of the camp of Saul. But he's an Amalekite. So what's he doing there? You know, was it that he saw what happened and kind of had this, immediately concocted this whole scheme to get a reward from David? And he goes down into the camp, puts the ashes on his head, and then rends his clothes to try and come out and look like he's not an Amalekite? I think that's what happened. Because he doesn't just come out and say, I'm Amalekite. He lets it slip. Okay. Because he comes out with his clothes rent, you know, and earth upon his head. He's putting dirt on his head. And it was so when he came to David that he fell on the earth and did obeisance. So he's looking like somebody who's really upset about the fact that Saul died. He's really upset about everything that's just taken place. But we know from the scripture that what he's really trying to do is just try to get a reward from David. This is just one, this is just one big con from this guy. He's a con man. So he's rending his clothes, he's, he's, and what is it? It's a, it's, it's, it's a fake humility, right? The earth, the rending of the clothes, and then it's this fake respect. He's bowing down, he's doing obeisance and calling David Lord, okay? It's fake, because he's trying to deceive him. And that's how liars work. 
You know, they use flattery a lot of times. When people start going overboard with the compliments and telling you things that you know aren't true, oh, you're so smart. It's like, no, I'm not that smart. <laughs> you're so good looking. It's like, no, I've got a mirror at home. Yes, what's going on here, right? And there's always a genuine compliment. We understand that. But sometimes people go way beyond what's appropriate. And that is a red flag. You know, and you say, well, does that kind of thing happen? It happens. And it, and it, it happens more than you might think. So if people disguise their true motives, right, with lies. But here's the thing about lying. The truth always comes out, okay? The truth always comes out. You ever notice that lying is hard to do? At least it is for me. Whenever <laughs> I try to do it, like, my mind's like, she's just like, you're just a liar. You can call me right out. Like, I had all these tells, you know. Kids always have tells. I'm not going to mention any tells that my kids, not that my kids ever lie. Right? That's a lie right there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But they'll, you know, they'll always do the, you know, they might do something when people are lying, the tongue sticks in the cheek or whatever, they can't look you in the eye, you know, they try to change the subject real quick. You know, the truth always has a way of kind of creeping out because lying is, is against our nature. Lying is hard to do. And people who, you know, this is an interesting thing, I, you know, I don't want to go on about it, but people who really get into like deception detection and stuff like that, people who look for people who are lying and, and, and false statements and stuff like that, there's a real science behind it. It's real interesting. And what you, what you realize real quick is that lying is incredibly stressful to the human psyche. It's very difficult. So when you have a good liar, you're dealing with somebody who's, you know, psycho a lot of times or a sociopath or has some, some deep-rooted problems, right? Because it's so stressful, people want the lie to end. You know, if they're trying, because, you know, when you first get caught, your, your, your initial reaction is, well, I'm just going to lie to try to get away from the punishment. A lot of times we're getting caught and we want to lie just not because we're trying to deceive or manipulate people for gain. We just want to save our hide, right? But a lot of times, even when we're doing that, you know, the, 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 the psychological stress of lying is so great that it just comes out. You know, the, the part of us wants to tell the truth. We just want the pressure to go away. We just want, the, we want to relieve ourselves of the, of the stress of lying. So if you learn to look for it, the truth does come out. Now, sometimes people just spill the beans, right? And that's what this guy does, right? Because remember, he's saying, it says that he came out of the camp of Saul, right? He's coming from the Israelites' camp. That's where Saul was. With his clothes rent, he's doing obeisance, he's got the dirt on it, he's playing the part. This is all part of his deception, it's part of his lie. He's disguising his true motives, but the truth comes out because it says in verse 3, And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel. But he's an he's Amalekite. So he's like, well, I'm an, he's trying to play across. He didn't say, I'm an, I'm an Israelite. He's just saying, I came out of the camp of Israel. You know, that's kind of a non-answer. From whence comest thou? What he's really saying, who are you? You know, what nation are you from? Well, I came out of the camp of Israel. Did he say, I'm an Israelite? No. But he didn't say he was an Amalekite either. Right? It's kind of this non-answer. But notice verse 8. When he's telling the story, he, lets the bean, he spills the beans. When he's telling the story to David, because the lie, the truth always wants to come out whenever people are lying. He's recounting the story of how he killed Saul in verse 8, remember? So this Amalekite is speaking in verse 8, and he says, And he, speaking of Saul, and he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered, I am an Amalekite. Whoop! <laughs> the truth comes out. When he's telling the story, when he's telling his lie, he says, I am an Amalekite. Uh-oh. Because if he knew anything about David, that's not what you want to let David know. Oh, I came out of the camp of Israel. Okay. I'm an Amalekite. Huh? <laughs> Excuse me? Right? Oh, you're an Amalekite. Oh. Well, I've been dealing with some Amalekites lately. That's that's eh, wrong answer for David. But what's happening in the story? This is what I believe. Is this guy is trying to lie to David, obviously. He's trying to get something. He's trying to manipulate him. And he's putting on this big con, but the truth comes out in the telling of the lie. The truth always finds a way of working itself out because it's so stressful to try and lie. You know, and the, and the thing about lying is that once you start lying, you got to keep it going, right? You got to keep up. You got to remember, okay, what did I tell them? You know, it's like when people are going to get interrogated, let's make sure our stories match up, you know, and they got to make sure their lie is, matches. And they got to, then it's just lie upon lie and lie upon lie. But the truth always wants to make its way out. <clears throat> and again, notice here that that David, you know, it says in verse 11, after he hears this news, you know, he, he rends his clothes and mourns and laments Saul and Jonathan and their death, right? As I kind of talked about in the beginning. 
but you know, this is probably not what the Amalekite imagined happening. You know, he's like, and he kind of tells him, well, I killed Saul, you know, it was a mercy killing. And he's expecting David to be like, yeah, well, thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you for taking out my, my enemy, you know, who's been persecuting me all these years. You know what? Give this guy a little something and send him on his way. That's what he was looking for. You know, give him some silver, give him some gold, give him some clean, you know, he's got these red clothes, you know, give him a new change of garments, you know, get, take him down to the river, let him clean himself up and, you know, and, and feed him. That's what he's looking for because he's covetous, just some kind of reward. <clears throat> but here's the thing about sin is that you cannot foresee the consequences of sin specifically. So this guy is sinning, right? He's got covetousness in his heart. He's lying to the man of God. He's trying to manipulate and, he can't, and then he sees David do what? Verse 14, take hold on his clothes and rent them. And likewise, all the men that were with him, and they mourned and wept and fasted even until even for Saul and Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they are fallen by the sword. Now imagine being this Amalekite, seeing this reaction. I mean, he's thinking in his head, I'm gonna go tell David that I killed the man that's been persecuting Saul. And he's gonna be so happy that I did that. He's gonna give me this big reward. He goes and he tells him his lie, and what happens? David just starts, you know, weeping and mourning and tearing his clothes. He's probably like, that's not the reaction I expected. Now he might be thinking, uh-oh, maybe I did something, maybe I did the wrong thing. Because here's the thing about sin, you cannot foresee the consequences. You think, well, I'm just gonna do this sin and things are gonna go a certain way, and then there's the, the you know, everything goes sideways. Everything just goes completely opposite of what you expected. And there you are, you're stuck. I mean, you're, he's, there's no backing out of this. He's already opened his mouth and told every, you know, let out the fact that he's an Amalekite, let on the fact that, you know, he, he killed, touched God's anointed, you know, which he actually didn't do, but he's going to pay the price anyway. You cannot foresee the specific consequences of sin. He didn't. I'm sh I guarantee you this is not the reaction he was expecting. He was expecting, you know, him, David to break out the timbrel and just start, you know, and, Dancing before the Lord, just having a big party. Saul's dead, you know, ding dong, Saul is dead, Saul is dead. You know, that's not what happened, though. He was very upset. Most likely not the reaction the Malachite was expecting. And, you know, I would imagine he probably got pretty nervous at this point. <clears throat> Verse 13, look what happens. And David said to the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am a son of a stranger and a Malachite. So now he's coming clean, right? Now he's not like, okay, now, he's, now there's no more non-answers. I came out of the camp of Israel. Now, he, now David gets done lamenting and mourning, and he goes to him and says, whence art thou? You know, I heard you say that you were from the camp of Israel, but then you're telling me the story that you said to Saul that you were, you, that you, you said that you said to Saul you were an Amalekite. So what is it, buddy? Which are you? You know, whence art thou? And he answered, I am a son of a stranger and a Malachite. So now he's getting real nervous. He's like, oh, I'm just going to tell the truth from here on out. You know, you say, well, you know, I've gotten into sin, but you know what, I'm just going to come clean now. I'm just going to stop sinning. I'm just going to, you know, clean up my life. I'm just going to stop. But you know what? The consequences are still going to come. You can't be assured of the consequences. You don't know what sin is going to bring. Verse 14, and David said to him, how wast, thou, how wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Now this guy is really like, oh, man. <laughs> David's mad. He's upset. And David called one of the young men and said, go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. So he has this Amalekite killed for what he did. And David said unto him, thy blood be upon thy head, for thou, thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. You say, was that right for David to do that? Yes, it was. Because it was this guy's own witness that brought it upon his own head. David just said, okay. you know, Because here's the thing, a guy that would say that he did that if he, you think if this guy actually had the opportunity to do that, he would have done it? Sure he would have. Because he's covetous. All he cares about is just getting some reward. All he, care, he doesn't care about who he kills, who he has to kill, who he has to lie to, what sin he has to get involved in. All he wants is to satisfy his lust. All he wants to do is just get his reward. He would have done it. And David said, you know what? Thy blood be upon thy head. Thy own, thine own mouth is testified against thee. Be it unto you. So here's the thing about, you know, and I'll wrap it up here, but you say, why should I live a godly life? I know I hear the preacher get up there and say, you know, if you live a life of sin, you know, you're going to, you can expect this. You know, if you go out and fornicate, there's a good chance you could get an STD. You could knock somebody up. You could be paying child support, you know, you, so on and so forth. 
You know, you go out and you start drinking and everything. You can get in car. You've heard all the things that the preachers say about sin, all the warnings that we try to give about drinking. You know, if you start smoking pot, it's going to lead to some other thing. It's all, you know all the things that we do say. But you know what's really frightening is the things you don't know. All the, all the consequences you have no clue about. All the consequences of skin that, that just we don't know, we can't warn you about because we don't know what could happen. Because, oh, you could get drunk and then get arrested. You could get drunk and smash into a light pole and the whole car could burst into flame. You could die, like my friend in high school. You think he thought about that? He thought, well, you know, I'm going to get drunk. It's bad for my liver. You know, I'm going to have a hangover tomorrow. I understand there's some consequences. It's the unforeseen consequences of skin that are the sin that are the scariest. It's the things you can't see coming that scare, should scare us the most into living a godly life and cause us to live uprightly. Because sin has consequences we could never even imagine. So, you know what? Don't be like the Amalekite. Don't be a covetous person. You know what? Learn to be content with the fact that you're one of God's people, that you're saved. You know, and, and maybe you're not going to have everything that the world has. Maybe you're not going to, you know, you're, if you want to live a godly life, you're not going to be able to just go enjoy all the pleasures of sin for the season. But you know what else you're not going to have to deal with? It's all the consequences, known and unknown, that come along with living a wicked life like that. Because that's where these sins lead to, other sins that end up destroying people. So let's just be content with the fact that, you know, we're saved. We don't have to experience any of this. We can live a good, godly, clean life, you know, we can have fun doing it. You know, I, I, I've been doing it, and I, I have lots of fun. You know, I laugh, I smile, I'm a happy person, I have joy in my heart, and you know what? There's no, there's no drugs involved, there's no alcohol involved, there's no sin involved, and you know, and, and so not only do I get to have all that, I don't have to deal with all of those consequences either. I don't have to deal with the cirrhosis of the liver, I don't have to deal with, you know, being a drug addict, I don't have to deal with any of that. And I get, you know, all the good things that God gives me too. And I'm just content with that. I mean, how is that? Not, how can you not be content with that? You know, but if you are discontented with the Christian life and you think, well, you know, I can live with the consequences of sin. Yeah, you might be able to live with the consequences you know about. You might be able to weigh it out and say, yeah, you know, I can live, I can live with a DWI or DUI or whatever it is. You know, I, I, can, I can live with those. Yeah, but it's the consequences you can't predict. Those are the ones you can't live with. So let's just live a godly life, you know, and let's just be content with the fact that we're saved, we're on our way to heaven, and we can enjoy the Christian life along the way. Let's pray.